This experimental manipulation, no matter what you're studying, is so powerful that it almost washes out any other effect. Like I would tell someone in a social, psycholo a social psychologist, don't use this unless you want a very powerful effect. I was thinking about you because do you know who John Cleese is? Yes, of course. Yeah, so he uh, tweeted um, that he feels discriminated against because Americans often pronounce his name rhyming with fleece and it actually rhymes with cheese. Um, and he says he suffered this microaggression for 57 years, demands compensation. So I was reading that and I was looking at my notes and I thought, na feast. And I thought, is this, are you a fleece or a cheese man? The feast. Yeah, I guess it's a... Uh... Fleece. Fleece. Fleece, fleece, yeah. Fleece. fleece, your fleece. Yeah, he's cheese. Exactly. Yeah, I will. I will yeah. not demand compensation from you, regardless of how you pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, Nafis, um, tell me a little bit. What does a cognitive scientist do? What is a cognitive science? What are you doing every day? Well, a cognitive scientist in general is just someone who studies how the mind works. And they can be anthropologists, they can be philosophers, they can be people working in artificial intelligence, psychology, neuroscience. So it's not a method-specific field. It's interdisciplinary. And that's the only way to study the human mind. In my case, I study radicalization, uh, as well as social fragmentation, terrorism, things like that. So I'm specifically looking at the mind of people who decide to use violence against another group of people, essentially, in its most broadly construed terms. Yeah. Also, I was just going to ask you this off topic, actually, but you sound American, but you're in London, aren't you? I am. I'm yeah, one of the refugees. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I, mean, I was born and raised in San Francisco, California. Uh, lived in a few different countries, moved to Europe 10 years ago, uh, lived in Paris for a number of years, then Barcelona, bounced around for a while. I was nomadic for a while. And now I've been in London for about three years. And I'm doing, I did my PhD here in, uh, at UCL and I'm a postdoc right now at King's College London. Oh, cool. Ça va ton français? Oui, c'est pas mal, mais en fait, ça fait il y a quelques années. Uh -huh. J'ai quitté Paris en fait, donc uh, c'est un peu difficile de m'exprimer en français. Ouais, j'ai la même ouais. chose. Et okay. tout bien en espagnol? Est-ce meilleur tout espagnol? Non, c'est pire. Catalan? Can you do any of the Catalan? No, no, oh, no man. Catalan, not yet. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know any of that Catalan stuff. But yeah, imp impressive that you speak. Yeah, it's impressive that you speak all those languages. Well, listeners will know that I don't stop mentioning it. I, like, honestly, it's become sort of a running joke and people message about it because I, I can't not mention it. And I think that's because, yeah. um, and maybe this is part of cognitive science, something you might have thought about, but I think this is just my view that humans are very, very selfish uh, and self-interested. And maybe that's a bit of a sad way of viewing stuff. But I think I put a lot of effort into learning uh, to speak five languages, right? I put loads of effort into it. And it's yeah. very rare you have an occasion to show that off. And even in a humble brag way, you know, usually if you put a lot of effort in stuff, you can say, oh, thank you for those awards that I've gotten. I really don't deserve them, you know, and you can humble brag. And I can't even do that. So I just have to go, look, I've spent a lot of time learning these and I never get to talk about it. So I'm just going to keep showing off about it. I guess in, from a psychology perspective, uh, so some people think that evolutionarily, you know, we're all sort of status seekers and I kind of agree, but I don't really agree because, and it just turns on the word status status for me assumes a sort of hierarchy. And I don't think people necessarily want to move up the chain of hierarchy. And there is research to show that even chimpanzees don't all want to become the alpha male. In fact, chimpanzees with low testosterone uh, get very stressed if you put them in the alpha male position. If like, a, like, like an experimenter kind of forcibly gives them the alpha male position. It's so cruel. <laughs> it's cruel. They don't like it. They don't want to be in that position. Their cortisol levels shoot up. Their behavior starts huh. becoming erratic. Some people don't want to be leaders. But I do think that everybody wants esteem. Everybody wants to be respected by the group and they want to feel like that they have a certain role and a fit within the group. And that even if you're a blacksmith, that you're considered a valuable member of the community because you're a blacksmith. And if you're a king, then you're a valuable member because you're a king. It doesn't really matter if there's a, a hierarchy there. What matters is that you feel that 
the group sees that what you're doing is valuable in some way. And that is related to radicalization because a lot of times people who go and join extremist groups, it's because they don't feel that way. They don't feel like their current role in society is one of esteem. Um, and oftentimes you'll see people who are petty criminals or you'll see people who are um, unemployed or you'll just see people who feel like they're kind of losing at life, even if it's quite subjective from their perspective. Usually when you see people make a transition into an extremist group, it's because there's some series of setbacks that hit their life. They got dumped by a girlfriend or, 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 or got divorced by a husband or kicked out of school or fired from work or lost some friends. It's usually a series of events that kind of really affects their self-esteem in some way. And are as a result on the search for a group that might be able to include them and welcome them in. And that's true for people who join cults. Uh, it can be true for people who even change from one mainstream religion to another mainstream religion. That's just, that's just part of the fabric of what makes someone go on the new identity market, essentially. I suppose the alpha male then of the monkeys and stuff, that that would be a domination game. So not everyone might be comfortable with the domination status game. But uh, we had, well, I say, I always do that. I say we had, and it's like, it's just me. Like, as if I've got a whole operation, I'm, I'm like Sky News or whatever. Uh, I had uh, Will Store on the podcast who talks about the status game. And he talked about there's the dominance status. And then there's also, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten them now, success and virtue. Because you'd get your food shared with you if in a tribe if you were also very good at stuff, so success like building things, and then uh, a virtue if you could uh, do nice things for people or at least show people you were doing nice things even if you weren't. So I guess we and I guess what you're saying is whenever people feel like they're not doing well enough in their particular status game, we all have different ones. That that's when they turn to extremism. Well, I mean that's when they turn to looking for an alternative group. And that'll and and then whether whether they whether that alternative group is an extremist group or not, that depends more on sort of what's and what's around in their social ecology, as we call it. You know, do they have a friend who's part of an extremist group? Did they come in contact with a recruiter in prison? Many of these people, had they come in contact with a Buddhist monk, maybe would have become Buddhist monks. You know, uh, it's hard to say. Actually, we don't actually know the research if. There are certain, this is kind of more of a controversial claim, which is people don't know if there are certain attributes that make someone, if you gave them a choice between being, being a Buddhist monk versus being a neo-Nazi, that they would choose the neo-Nazi or choose the jihadist group or choose a violent group, as opposed to any other group that has many of the same sort of qualities but are not violent, in the sense that they're, they have a strong collective cohesion, they have a strong identity, strong values, regalia, culture, etc. Um, and some people think that there are certain attributes um, for aggression and other things that maybe might make someone more prone to going down the violent pathway. I think what you'll find is that there's some people who could genuinely go either way, and there's some people who may be more prone because of their personality disposition to go one way or the other. Now, in terms of percentages of people who have joined extremist groups, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Does this mean, again, this is my pessimistic view of, of humankind, like we all need something, we all need to show something to a tribe. Why can't we just be like, oh, well, I don't have a thing? Right? Why is that the pursuit of things like Buddhism, for example? Are they trying? To, I don't know enough about it. Are they trying to sort of go, "Hey, you don't need to have your thing; just be," you know? Yeah. Well, so uh, on the first part of it, um, part of it is because we're social animals. You know, we're not we're not we're not like other animals that are out there on their own surviving. We're like chimpanzees. We're like wolves. We're actually terrible in terms of climbing, in terms of hunting on our own, in terms of fighting. We're a pretty weak animal, a single human, just like a single chimpanzee, just like a single wolf out there won't do so well in the environment. They really need to be part of the pack. And that's where their attributes come out. So the survival instinct of humans is very much related to being and staying part of a, of a group of people. And, and like all social animals, there are moral norms. And when a norm is violated, even when wolves violate a norm, they eat too much of their, too much of the kill, for example, they'll be shunned by the rest of the group. 
And in some cases, in the case of wolves, for example, they can kind of go into a purgatory type situation, kind of like a, a wolf prison where they kind of hang out on the outskirts of the wolf pack. And maybe depending on the level of the transgression, they'll let the wolf back in after a while, after it's served its due and has been punished. Sometimes they'll never let the wolf back in, depending on the level of transgression, and then they'll just have to go off on its own and just die, basically. So humans are wired to really care about what other people think about us. Um, that's what allows us to stay in the group. That's uh, But the, the difference between us and other social animals is our groups are highly malleable because we have language and sort of this more complex thought. So therefore, what constitutes the tribe is not just your next of kin, not just your blood relatives, but we can construct identities like Christians or Muslims or British or American, these social constructs, which can be billions of people large. And then we can say now we're part of that identity and we'll follow the social mores of that community. And we'll try to appeal to that community in order to stay in the good graces of that community in order to continue to survive. Oh man, that's fascinating. I think you know, so I I grew up in like a Jewish family, right? But not really practicing, but there was some sort of culture stuff going on. And I had like an aversion to being seen as that because I wanted to be, I'm my own thing. Don't I'm not that thing. But then I was also, and this is gonna sound a bit glib, but I was also a big football fan, right? And my team is Tottenham, and that's like my big that's my identity, so to speak, right? From a young age, my dad would have shown me Arsenal, the, their rivals t-shirt and gone like boo, bad, and here's a Tottenham one, good. And that sort of got in my head. It's almost brainwashed from a young age. And now I physically see like Tottenham players are somehow better than Arsenal players, even though that's obviously ridiculous. And I wonder if the reason I had some sort of or less of a need to fit in with maybe the Jewish thing or any other sort of club was that I had that football one. Could, could could having like a football tribe or something as ridiculous as that maybe make someone less um, in, in search or in pursuit of, of something that might be an extremist uh, tribe? Yeah, so there's there, there are um, different hypotheses on that. So a lot of people would argue that having one strong identity is better than having multiple weak identities. Hmm. And that kind of makes sense, again, psychologically, because if there's one strong identity, then to some degree, you can count on that identity to protect you. Now, I don't know in the case of a football club, if you feel right. like when push comes to shove, they're going to be the ones when the apocalypse hits to you know come bring you water and food and take care of you. <laughs> I think maybe the Jewish community might actually be the better bet so when, 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 it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to that sort of in-group loyalty. Um, yeah. But um, but had I had I gone too far in that as some people do, maybe I'd be like an orthodox. Or just, I mean, it is a separate community, of course, the orthodox sure. Jewish community. To know, but maybe I might have become some you know something of like that, and that can be very uh, destructive, right? A lot of the orthodox, and I don't want to go too much in a second. They 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 get very upset with me uh, when I do have a go at that kind of thing, as as I do any extremist group. But they're they're. They're actually quite horrible. Some of them, some of the ultra orthodox, are quite quite horrible. And and isn't the Tottenham one less um pain, you know, less destructive? Well, yeah. I mean, so so some groups tend to be more closed, and other groups tend to be a little bit more open. So there's there's work by a researcher named William Hogg, where he talks about uh, groups that have high entitivity. Entitivity is just a fancy word for entity. Like it's very clear that this group is a group. Uh, and it has clear in-group, out-group boundaries, very clear values, shared goals. It's not sort of a more amorphous, difficult to define group. Like Americans, for example, would be a kind of a difficult to define group. I mean, there's the passport, but even within the United States, people talk about, oh, this is, this is not real America, I'm not a real American. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, when you meet American expats in Europe, like I have, this is their favorite thing to say, I'm not really American, but I'm like, yeah, but you are. <laughs> you are American. Um, yeah, because it's not a group with a high entitivity. It's it's kind of it's yeah. a very amorphous group that's constantly changing over over generations. Now there's other groups like neo Nazis or jihadists, but even like like you know conservative religious groups or even small small tribes in different parts of the world, you could say have very clear entitivity. Now some of those groups don't allow new members in at all. You have to kind of be essentially born into that tribe to be a member of that group. 
Other groups, and if it's going to be an extremist group, usually or like a violent extremist group, they, they constantly need new recruits, so they will accept new members. But the question then becomes what psychologically makes someone search, if they're going to search out for a new group to join, why would they pick a group with high entitivity as, one, as opposed to one with lower entitivity, one that's a bit more amor- amorphous and open? And the argument is that people who have a uh, lower uh, threshold for uncertainty will be the ones who go for the higher entity group. Oh. Meaning they just, the, the complexity, the world is too complex as it is. It's too difficult. Their life is too difficult. They don't know who they are. Uh, asking them to embrace the complexity and the uncertainty, both of themselves and the world is just going to cause them to be anxious, essentially. It's just going to make them probably even depressed. And what these groups with high entitivity do is they kind of see the world in a more black and white way. They give you very clear rules of how to behave, what to eat, what to wear sometimes, what to believe, you know, like they really give you the rule book almost moment to moment for how to live your life. And you really feel like you're part of this, this community that's going to protect each other. And, you know, it's even a little bit like joining a gang to some degree. And what's ironic about joining a gang is that if you talk to a lot of kids who join gangs, they'll say, well, I grew up in the streets and it was dangerous and the gang protected me. But statistically, you're more likely to go to jail or get killed if you're a member of a gang than if you also just lived in that neighborhood and you weren't a member of that gang. However, the feeling of protection, the feeling of safety is actually higher if you're a member of the gang than if you're just hmm. a regular guy living in the street. That's because we're not very good at probabilistic thinking, humans. Um, huh. Yeah. So, but again, that goes back to our evolutionary psychology. There's a reason for that. We, our brain uses heuristics. It uses these shortcuts to, uh, to, to act as proxies for different things that evolutionarily we need to care about. So one proxy is be part of a highly cohesive and entitive group and you'll be protected. That's one of the mental shortcuts. It's not going to, it would be inefficient for the brain to have evolved this complex statistical machinery to actually go out there and calculate the rate at which you're going to get killed if you're just hanging out on the street versus a member of the gang. It just says group, join the group, you're protected. Um, and so that's yeah. probably why a lot of people join those kinds of groups. It's an out- outdated uh, feature of our systems i suppose that yeah they didn't have to worry about things like terrorism uh a hundred thousand years ago i suppose that um that not real american thing that that why does that annoy me i sort of feel a bit annoyed by that is it is it do i feel like that's cowardly like just going like hey that's not me i'm better than that yeah there's something very pretentious about it i mean i try not to say stuff like that Yeah. Even though maybe I feel it sometimes. I don't know. I mean, I I I kind of get I kind of get it because look, I mean, if you're if you're someone who who left the country and hardly ever goes back, I kind of get that you can, you know, claim some sort of detachment from that identity if you want to. But I also do think it's a little bit uh, is there's a bit of self-denial in there too. People want to Again, I, it could be a bit of virtue signaling, right? It could be a bit of include me, hey, Europeans, include me in your tribe because look, I'm rejecting my previous tribe. So make me a member of yours. It could be something like that too. It's hard though, isn't it? Because as soon as you speak, I can hear it in your or any other American's voice. And maybe that's just a superficial thing. So it's not, It's not. maybe there's nothing else that is American about somebody, not that that's a good or bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't deny the fact that I've... Uh, a lot of American qualities uh, in me. And some of them I've come to appreciate actually over the years, funny enough. It happens, I, right? Yeah. That happens. So, so I was just going to say, because because I think you grow up and you're sort of young and 18, 19, 20 years old. And I think you do have that rejection of a lot of stuff. I'll go back to that Jewish stuff. I was very, very, you know, and you get, because you don't want somebody to think, oh, you must be like the worst kind of person that you imagine. And there's that self-hate and the virtue signaling, as you say. And then you get older and I feel like maybe it's less, you're a bit braver and you're a bit more, you look back and go, oh, well, hang on. Why shouldn't I be able to be proud of who I am? And Why shouldn't someone from America, you know, be proud just like anyone else is proud of stuff? Yeah. And also, I think for me, in my case, it's just been living in Europe and seeing the contrast. In the beginning, I, I think I wanted to reject it more to embrace in the beginning French culture more and then, and then other cultures after that. And then, you know, just as it you know, it's kind of like after a while, the novelty wears off. And you know, I've been living in Europe now for 10 years. 
And so now when I do go back to the US, there are certain qualities that I'm like, oh, this is this is cool that people are like this. For example, there's a lot of optimism in American culture. You know, like people yeah. really, really do believe in each other and, and believe in a brighter future. And there's an amazing way when you're there, you can kind of just sense the the optimism of the people and the way people will introduce you to other people and like connect to you. And, oh, I have a friend who does the same thing that you or somewhat similar to you do. Let me introduce you to them immediately. You know, there's this, it's kind of like that you can feel that there's a, there's a disposition towards a bright future. Whereas, you know, I'm not saying everyone here is depressed or anything like that either. I'm not saying it's like <laughs> the polar opposite, but you know, it's not, it's not as much. It's, it's a little bit more muted, let's say, the optimism. Yeah, you start to appreciate those things. I found exactly Exactly the same thing. I was. I would talk badly about Britain, uh, and again, there's also the embarrassment that America and Britain are sort of these powerhouses, uh, and there's the culture, which is probably because of America. Like everybody speaks English. A lot of people speak English. We all watch English English language movies and stuff. So you feel that sort of like you don't want to. You don't want to be lording it over everyone, um, and that that there must be something unique and special about these other countries. But I found the same thing. Like I was in Germany just for three years. Just got back, and it's just like oh, what a breath of fresh air to have people in the UK. And even if it's not as much as in America, just being like, hi, how's it going? You all right? Because you know, Germany was so uh, sort of grim, <laughs> very lovely, intelligent people and lots of fascinating things about their culture, but just just very different ways of, uh, well, not smiling in, in conversations. And uh, that became diff- difficult. I want to ask, is there a sense as well, you were talking about um, uh, why people go, go into these groups and it was a sense of, of obviously evolutionarily that's important to be the, the social aspect um is there also a sense sometimes and i'm thinking more of things like anti-vaxxers and stuff like that is there a sense of wanting to be special to know something that others don't i think that depends on the group for example yeah so i would say that in western society we because it's a more individualistic society and because of liberalism we do we do put out these norms that you know you should you, you shouldn't engage in group think you know you should think independently you should be a bit iconoclastic you should challenge the status quo those are not norms in in every culture in the world and you could say even historically within the west they're relatively recent cultural norms essentially post enlightenment norms um, so maybe that can, again, puts that, that impetus can put someone on the pathway to looking for alternative sources of information doing their own research. But then ironically, what ends up happening is they end up falling into a group. Usually they end up falling into an echo chamber into an online community, a telegram channel, a WhatsApp group where they all reinforce each other's ideas. And it becomes very difficult to communicate with them because then they consider any alternative source of information to be misinformation, to be, to be, you know, uh, you know, not credible in some way. And you know, we kind of do it too. I mean, those of us who are not anti-vaxxers, I don't want us to act like you know we're somehow so much better. I just think we trust mainstream sources of information a little bit more. That's that seems to be the main difference. This is the thing. I have this conversation every day with a, a friend of mine who uh, is a bit of an anti-vaxxer and he's a bit anti-mask and stuff. And he's not. I wouldn't say he's extreme or anything. But I have these conversations, and I do sometimes think, well, maybe, maybe, how do I know I'm not the one? Who just because I believe the mainstream thing, and I try and ask a friend of mine who's a doctor, and he says, "Well, vaccines probably are better to, for you to get." He's trying to claim like, "Oh, you can just get healthy exercise and stuff like that." And it's so hard, isn't it? Because how do you have that argument w- without uh, patronizing someone? How how might I bring him round? And how do I even know I'm right? I think that's where just good evidence and argumentation sort of plays a role. Although I don't think argumentation and reasoning play a big role in actual belief change. But it's at least something that we can use for ourselves if it's something we're committed to to wanting to be. If we want to be, if accuracy really matters, it's important. I mean, for me personally, I still also use shortcuts. Like I'm a member of the scientific community. So I know how hard it is for there to be any sort of scientific consensus on anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything in the industry is set up for you to disagree with each other. The more you can carve out your own little niche and your own little theory and to show that everyone else is wrong and that you're right, <laughs> then you're going to get the funding, and then you're going to get the big publications, then you're going to get the tenure track job. If you're just sitting around saying, yeah, everyone's basically more or less on the right track, you're, you're just not going to move up in the in, in, in the career pathway. So when 
I mean, it, when it comes to vaccines, it's a bit more complicated, but let's say climate change, for example, where there is overwhelming scientific consensus that, you know, humans are playing a role in this. Um, well, I know when the, that level of consensus, that, I mean, and of course, there are still some people who, who maybe will disagree with it, but the level of consensus that currently exists amongst climate scientists is a level of consensus a consensus you'd see almost nowhere else in in the scientific world. I mean, it's so hard to achieve that. And everything is systemically set up in order to not achieve that level of consensus. So the fact that it gets achieved, for me, that's my heuristic. You know, like, yes, I am trusting the climate scientists. I'm not going in there and analyzing the data myself and evaluating everything on its own. I know the system. I know how hard it is to achieve that level of consensus within the system. And so that's why I trust it. Is it like 97% or something of climate scientists? Very really? high. Yes, mm. somewhere in that range. It's funny what, what you're saying about science, sciences and stuff. I could, I could relate. I, I studied English literature. And again, everything is set up. You're being rewarded uh, for disagreeing with the author, with your other, you know, if you can come in with the most out there theory possible about what the author was trying to say. Uh, and I think it might even be worse in that respect, because you're even re rewarded basically for things that aren't there, uh, as opposed to science, at least you have to show things that are there. I think the humanities, it can be it can be quite dangerous, because you're being trained for years to, and I was loving it. I used to love coming in with like, oh, you know, Shakespeare was gay, and here's why. And, you know, like the most outrageous Although that might be true, actually, um, outrageous theories. I don't know. Is that is that a worry in in, in universities and stuff? Um, do you are you concerned about that sort of thinking? I'm worried about it in terms of the ability to have policy implications. Uh, you know, I've worked with different governments on counter extremism, counter terrorism policy, and one thing that keeps coming up from government officials is, like for example, in France, one of the one of the the heads of the counter terrorism the equivalent of their counterterrorism commission said to me, she said, I don't want to talk to researchers anymore. You guys all have your own little pet theories and your own individual ideas. And you all, you know, like you all disagree with each other so much that, you know, come to me once you have some consensus and then we can start having some evidence-based policies on that. But if you don't have consensus, I'm going to trust my intuitions over it essentially. Now, here's the funny thing is there is major consensus. We just use different words for the exact same things, you know, or or at least or at least it's very similar concepts because we're all trying to engage in product differentiation. Right. We're all trying to say, no, no, my theory is so <laughs> different than the next theory over. So, well, even though they may have 80 percent, 85 percent overlap anyways. And, yeah, there may be some important areas of change. But if you were to take the Venn diagram of all these different theories out there, there's a huge amount of consensus that's out there. And I think we're shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit because we're limiting ourselves to have an impact because we don't have as collective of a voice often. Uh, because we constantly are trying to challenge the other person's authority or come up with new labels to make ourselves sound special and unique. That's so interesting. I love that because it's. I'm just thinking of like trans. The trans issues is one of the hottest topics at the moment, and like I think you're right. Like like it must be 85 percent, 90 percent. I don't know. At least among people I know who disagree vehemently on Twitter, all all seem to think it's yeah okay. We want trans people to have rights and to be happy and this and that. And there's a disagreement about who should be forced to use pronouns or not. And it's just like this. Small thing or, or BLM I'm, I'm thinking of as well a lot of people like most people I know anyway would would, would all agree you know of course there's, there's been inequalities and this and that but maybe disagree to what extent or disagree about uh, the specific uh, BLM because it has associations with some other things and we're squabbling over like the, 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 the small bits that we don't agree on right yeah and I would say I mean like with BLM for example there's also an active attempt by certain people in other groups to malign them, right? To, for example, there's BLM, I think it's a corporation, or I think it's like an actual incorporated organization. It's more of a private business, which is different than BLM, the kind of broader movement. There's also the, the initial sort of BLM uh, uh ideas or statistics that that the movement was based on which was about you know cops disproportionately killing african americans which has become a bit controversial and so now it's because the statistics don't seem to be bearing out exactly as one would predict however the overall argument that the criminal justice system clearly shows a bias towards arresting and incarcerating and severely punishing black people is that that research is pretty clear that that there's a lot of systemic I guess you could say yeah, discrimination. Uh, 
However, you know, when I talk to my friends, so I, I have some friends who have you know gotten sucked into QAnon and uh, and, and other groups like that. Um, and the information that they're being exposed to is not that same information. They're not actually going to the source and reading what BLM is actually saying or what the activists are saying, right? They're just they're looking at memes. They're looking at edited videos of rioting and things like that. They're looking at selective quotes from leaders of the BLM corporation, not the actual movement. And even when I try to correct the narrative, I can tell that they're not going to fully accept it because it's not... The belief in these ideas is part of the group membership again, right? Like the fact that they want to be a part of this underground, subversive, online movement means they have to believe in these things. And the more I chip away at their beliefs, at these ideas, the more they feel like they're less central members of this group, which again goes at an evolutionary level, at an evolutionary level, makes them feel less safe. It gives them less psychological safety. Because I'm pulling them out of their movement. It's the same thing as like when you try to argue with a friend of yours who's religious or something. Mainstream, not even talking about like any sort of orthodoxy. You're not going to really change their belief because ultimately those beliefs are linked to their in-group membership. It's linked to their identity. And so they have to believe these things to stay a member of the group. Mm, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, even I, I find myself, and I try not to have any commitments to one way or another as much as possible because I think that's quite that's a journalistic goal we have to have but I'm a little bit cynical of some of the BLM stuff just for exactly the reasons you pointed out and I have to accept that I, I might be being sucked in certain ways or not and to hear you say things very rationally that maybe don't correspond 100% although they correspond 99.9% with my beliefs it's almost slightly painful it almost hurts to have uh, a, a, my, my, a belief of mine challenged uh, it's like it hurts in my head, and I, I suppose I suppose that's what you're saying, isn't it? About it's, it becomes part of your identity, your belief, and to have that pulled out from under you, uh, you don't want that, do you? Yeah, it also depends on how the person is doing it too. Um, like if you if you feel the person is engaging with you in clear attempts to try to pull you out of your group and into their group, um, the bias is very clear, and so. There's some great uh, evolutionary psychology uh, theories on this, specifically by Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber on uh, the argumentative theory of reasoning. And so reasoning was originally thought to have evolved for problem solving, right? It's it's to uh, build new tools, to do scientific discoveries, to solve whatever physical material problem we as humans may have out there. And that's how we've built up cities and civilizations and everything that we've built up coming from the coming from the jungle, essentially. But if that was the case, why would we be so bad at reasoning, right? I mean, even science is not really very natural to humans. It, ha- it took a long time to evolve and you kind of have to teach it to kids at a young age. And if you don't teach it at a certain age, it doesn't always kind of... Um, that doesn't always translate into adulthood. So it seems clearly much more like like the problem solving aspect of reasoning is a much more social evolution than something that was, um, you know, biologically uh, endowed within us. And we have all sorts of cognitive biases from confirmation biases to availability heuristics to my side biases to whatever. And so the evolutionary theory of, of the argumentative theory of reasoning kind of said, the opposite. They said the point of reasoning is persuasion. That's why you reason. You reason to persuade. You reason to argue with people and to and to win in the arguments with people. And the reason why you're trying to win in those arguments is sort of it's a non-kinetic form of warfare between one group and another group. Essentially, you're trying to create an alliance with another group by reasoning and talking with them and saying, let's join together and do something together so that way we can force force multiply our resources. Or you're trying to maybe convince a group to do something that's very bad for them, but very good for your group. You're trying to deceive them Mm. in some way. We're so selfish. People are selfish. Oh, well, we're so well. We're we're, we're kind of like uh, I wouldn't say selfish. We're like groupish. Let's put it that way, right? Group More selfish. So than selfish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
and or, or you're trying to pluck people out of another group and bring them into your group, right? So you've developed all of these techniques for being able to persuade people, and that's evolutionarily endowed. And at the same time, we have what's called epistemic vigilance, which is the ability to resist those attempts at persuasion, which is the reason why we have all these biases. These biases are not bugs of the system. They're features of the system. The whole point of all these biases is to make you very good at trying to persuade someone else while also being very good at not being <laughs> persuaded by someone else so that way ultimately your tribe wins in the non-kinetic warfare that is argumentation so if you can over that's i guess that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying as much as possible and i obviously i'm not alone in this a lot of us try and do this to ignore that painful sense of saying don't be persuaded i'm trying to say listen to that because you're even if you don't fully go over to that side you'll be smarter and maybe happier for, for understanding the other side. Is that the way through? Well, I mean, that's that's a value system that you um, adopt. It's a value system that I also adopt. And I think for a global society like the one we're living in now that's so interconnected, I think it's really important for, those, for us to have those values. They still need to be embedded in a social network, though. We still need to feel socially rewarded for engaging in that kind of behavior. Look, I'm I'm an academic. I'm surrounded by a lot of academic friends. And within that community, showing uh, resistance to in-group biases oftentimes is socially rewarded. People will be impressed and be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. He's just kind of entertaining thoughts that are not, you know, uh, tribal thoughts within our little community. So I'm still getting the social reward from my community because the community all adopts those values together and we reward and punish each other in some way for adhering to those values. But a lot of people don't belong in those kinds of communities. So to ask them to do that is to either say, just be a total loner and just try to um you know reward yourself for doing these things and you know again there are certain people that can do that and there's certain people who are kind of built that way to be loners but that's not that's not the human condition that's not an expectation we can expect to have at a large scale for most of society man i don't want to sound repetitive but we're so selfish and i know you're trying to resist that a bit from optimism maybe and but but even even that and you're right because as you said it, i recognized it in myself the reason i want to be that way just like you is because it's recognized and, and respected in journalism if you're a journalist who can look at both sides and whatever so the only reason we do anything is just because it's respected you like it's like we're mice in cages and you have to sort of give dopamine injections and give extra bits of water and sugar for us to do anything yeah i mean i guess i i, I <laughs> yeah i don't really like the, the selfish term because i guess the way i operationalize it is that and a selfish person is willing to screw over their own in-group, even if they can get ahead. They're engaging in very instrumental thinking. Whereas if you're trying to adhere to the values of a group, then to some degree you are taking costs, I'm sure, in being even-handed. Maybe if you were less even-handed, let's say, and you were more polarizing and you were more of an Alex Jones figure, you might have a way bigger following in your podcast and your YouTube or whatever. There would be social rewards out there for you to, mm. and that would be on a selfish level, very beneficial for you. Because it wouldn't be from like the people that I've grown up to respect, you know, my old teachers or my family and my friends who would see me doing this Alex Jones stuff and I'd be really embarrassed because I've got different ideas and stuff. And I wouldn't want to screw people over, right? I don't want to do well at the expense of someone else perhaps but that's because of my empathy which i can't control i just feel that way and it makes me feel bad it hurts again if i do a thing that hurts someone else so right. it, i still feel like i'm being selfish <laughs> well i would say that you're still taking costly sacrifices you're, you're still making sacrifices uh to live up to the ideals of the group and mm. in that way i would say you're just being a human you know, yeah. and not particularly being selfish, because to me, a selfish person, like a true narcissist, for example, or someone who really is genuinely a selfish human being within within the range of human behavior. So I would, I would argue that humans are not selfish, they're groupish. But then within humans, you can have selfish people, people who vary. 
who don't have that empathy, who don't really care, who see the world as instrumental, who will say and do whatever to get ahead, even if it means burning, uh, you know, previous groups and transitioning to another group in order to get yourself ahead. You know, those people wouldn't make those costly sacrifices, for example. They would literally just be looking at, in a very kind of uh, instrumental way, how does this benefit me full stop? And if you can show me that something benefits me, and even if it comes at the cost of other people, I don't care. I still feel like it's a bit genetic or environmental so it's like deterministic isn't it like if you don't have that empathy thing in you then that's you know how it is i want to i want to ask a question for like like aspiring journalists and scientists out there i mean how does one get to work with the new york times how does one get to make a, a really cool video like like you had how does that come about you just kind of have to put your ideas out there i mean i was i was sort of uh under the radar like i wasn't putting anything out there until the Paris uh, Bataclan attacks in November 2015. So I've been working already for a couple of years in this field, but I hadn't published anything. And then a colleague of mine uh, and I wrote this article in the New York Review of Books called War- Paris, the War ISIS Wants. And that became, that went kind of viral because it came out three days after the, the actual attacks. And then once that door opened for me, a lot of other doors basically started opening. So it was kind of just that one article and then just sort of staying on top of it and taking a lot of rejection. I mean, you know, I get more, you know, uh, pitches turned down than I get pitches that are actually successful and mm-hmm. just staying resilient. And, you know, I've built up relationships with editors over the years and sometimes they'll even get on. I mean, a lot of people, sometimes people won't even ask an editor, can I get on a phone call and talk to you? Because they just assume that it's wrong or that you're wasting that person's time. There are yeah. some editors out there who will actually, who prefer that. They don't mind, you know, they're boiling their pasta and they have no problem jumping on the phone while talking to you and hearing what you have to say. And when you actually can get someone on a phone like that, you'll, you'll get a lot more feedback than just a yes or a no. They'll even tell you ways to improve your pitches. And in, in the case of a scientist, the more you give to journalists, the more they'll actually help you as well. So oftentimes I give my time for free to doing interviews or whatever, and then I'll say, I'll do it, but hey, I want you, can I in the future, if I'm working on a pitch, send it to you, and if you can give me some feedback on it from a journalistic perspective, what you think works and doesn't, that would be really useful as well. And ultimately just going out for a coffee or a beer or whatever, and kind of getting to know people and building relationships. Uh, the New York Times video, for example, was directed by a friend of mine, Adam, who works for the New York Times, who I knew before he worked for the New York Times. And we've been talking for a long time about wanting to do something together. And so finally I put this pitch together and he got it approved. And it wasn't an easy process. I mean, I had to go into the New York offices and kind of pitch it in person. I happened to be in New York at the time and pitch it in person as well. And but then, yeah, I mean, as you kind of build up a profile, it's like success builds more success, essentially, and people start coming to you after a while. Oh, that's cool. That thing you said about rejection, I can relate uh, to that. It's so funny. I always read these things online. You you read like, you know, J.K. Rowling was rejected six times before whatever. And it's like, I got rejected six times before breakfast today. Like, that, <laughs> yeah. that is nothing. Like, I'm just about a, a hundred times a day. You know, if I'm not, it's almost insulting not to be rejected now. It's like a badge of honor. Like, I, I'm, I'm, it's almost an addiction now. Where's my next rejection going to come from? So, like, you just got to yeah. keep going, don't you? And I, I mean, I tell people, like, like young students or whatever, I'm like, you know, it's really about quantity over quality in the beginning because quality comes with quantity. The more pitches you write, the more articles you write, you're just going to keep getting better and better at it because you're practicing the craft more and more. So if you become too precious and too perfectionist about the very first pitch that you put out or even the second or third, you're just not going to be putting out the quantity that's necessary in order to see the quality improve. Yeah. Um, what were you, I mean, I'm just, I'm just double checking. It's Naf- Nafis Hamid. Is that your Twitter? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so people can find in your Twitter, Nafis Hamid, at Nafis Hamid. Yeah, at the top, there's this video, which I loved. Um, when you were, th- you're throwing a ball around, tell me about the ball thing. But also, how did you film that? I presume you just, you, you then have to sit in someone else because you're throwing the ball to yourself and it's in different seats. Yeah, I just move at lightning speed, man. It was all filmed in one take. <laughs> um... Yeah, so, so that relates to uh, one of our brain scan studies that we did with jihadist sympathizers. So I was in Barcelona and I found these young guys who I was kind of, my remit was to go out there, do all these surveys, do all these interviews, find radicalized people and get them into a brain scanner and look at what's going on in the brain. And so for one of that group, it was like a uh, these young Moroccan origin kids 
I would say they were at a pretty early stage of radicalization. So you could ask him questions like, you know, do you agree with Palestinian right of return or, or women wearing hijabs or, or Islamic teaching in public schools or even the caliphate or armed jihad or whatever? And then they would say yes or no. And they would say a value was like sacred or not sacred to them. But then we'd ask them, what would you do for this value? And if they said they would be willing to engage in some form of violence, violent protest, joining a jihadi group, you know, carrying out a lone actor attack, then we would say, okay, they're they're at an early stage of radicalization. They support one of these ideas and they're saying that they're willing to do some political violence for it. And then we wanted to see, okay, what can actually increase someone's radicalization? We didn't want to you know, do something that was so crazy that we would turn them into jihadists and set them back into the world. But we did want to see what can move them up a little bit in terms of the radicalization spectrum. So we recruited 38 of them. We brought them to the laboratory. And one by one, we had them play. It was a virtual ball game for the sake of the video, you know, just to make it more cinematic. We had me tossing the ball, but it was actually a video game where the Moroccan origin player was sitting there. And there was three other players that they were virtually playing with who all had Spanish sounding names and Spanish faces. They turned out to not be real players, but they thought they were real players sitting in other rooms um, who were also participating in this experiment. And then they would just play this virtual toss ball game. It's called Cyber Ball. And in the control group, the, the ball was tossed an equal number of times between the, the participant and then the three Spanish players. In the experimental group, the, after one or two tosses to the Moroccan origin player, the three Spanish players just tossed the ball back and forth to each other. Now, you might think that this is a kind of a small little experiment. What effect can it really have? So this is a very popular experimental manipulation in social psychology. It's been used all over the place for for studying not only violence, but self-control, for studying uh, discrimination, for studying all sorts of things. And it's actually incredibly powerful as a, as, as a, as a psychological manipulation across cultures, which first of all, just shows us how sensitive as humans we are to any slight feeling of social rejection that this little tiny two minute virtual <laughs> toss ball game from India to China to Japan to Australia, from young kids to old kids, it doesn't really matter. This experimental manipulation, no matter what you're studying, is so powerful that it almost washes out any other effect. Like I would tell someone in a social psychology, a social psychologist, don't use this unless you want a very powerful effect. Because although it seems simple, from every metric, from saliva swabs, you see testosterone shoot up and and cortisol and cortisone shoot up, and you see cortisol shoot up. Uh, you see uh, skin conductance getting highly active. You see on survey reports, people start reporting lower self-esteem, lower senses of belonging, higher aggression. It's incredible. Although consciously the person, when you just, I mean, when you just look at someone from the outside, they don't seem like they're all agitated, but at the level of the human mind at a physiological level, they're really reacting to this in a very strong way. So then we put them in a scanner and we have them look at values that are either sacred or non-sacred to them. And I should probably back up and talk a little bit about what, what that concept is. So sacred values are a subset of moral values that we hold to be almost absolute and that we're willing to engage in some sacrifice in order to defend those values. So that could be freedom of speech or free and fair elections if it's a liberal democratic value system. It could be uh, you know, an ethnostate or remigration of immigrants if it's a white nationalist ideology. It could be the establishment of a caliphate and strict Sharia as a rule of law if it's a jihadist group. The point is that whatever the value is, if it's sacred to you as a person and you feel like it's coming under threat in some way, you're gonna fight and die. You're gonna, you're gonna rise up to defend that value. Um, and so the, the participants get in, we knew what the values were sacred and non-sacred to them from the survey work, and they evaluate on a scale of one to seven their willingness to fight and die for each value. And two interesting things ends up, two interesting things happen. Um, the group that was excluded started showing that their non-sacred values started to become more like sacred values. So essentially a part of the brain that was only associated with sacred values previously, which is a part that's associated with rule processing. You just apply a rule. This is the rule. I'm going to apply it. I'm not going to think contextually about it. I'm not going to look at all the nuances of it. This is just the moral rule and that's it. That part of the brain was active only for sacred values previously. If they were socially excluded, it came online for non-sacred values as well. And they increased their explicit willingness to fight and die for those values if they were socially excluded, approaching sacred value levels. 
And some of the non-sacred values even were reported as now being sacred after the, um, after the experiment. So what we're showing is that these people who were kind of on the edge of this ideology, who had a few sacred values and said they were willing to engage in violence for them, this little two-minute toss ball game started making those non-sacred values move into the sacred value column with all of its resulting neural and behavioral implications of... Um, of being more dogmatic and more willing to use violence as well. Now, of course, we didn't want to go any further than that, you know, because we have to set these people off into the world and we you know we debrief them and we told them it was all fake and, you know, those players don't exist and this is why we were doing it. Was it did they laugh? Did they find that, like, oh God, you know? Uh, it varied from person to person. I think some were curious. Some some flicked me off, you know, they threw me the middle finger. Did and they? they <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it depended, it depended on, on the individual. Um. So, yeah, so, so, so that's worrying because there's been no real research to show how to desacralize a value once the value becomes sacred. Um, so it stays way, there like, forever? It's, it, no, no, it can become desacralized. It's just no necessary, we just don't know how to make it less sacred. I had a moment the other, the, a couple of weeks ago, I was out with some old friends of mine and there was a situation where, um, we were getting a taxi and there wasn't enough space for everyone and uh, the guys were all quite drunk and I I wasn't and so they all just got in and left me and another guy who I didn't really know and we had to walk to this place they just got a cab and it was like a 25 minute walk and I had a, I, it's, it's basically the ball game isn't it and I suddenly had all these thoughts and ideas it actually ruined my night whereas I think some people might have been capable of just being like oh come on whatever and like we all have a laugh I felt really uh, really low and for quite a few days was being a bit uh, off and I was embarrassed to be off because it's like I'm not a child I know it was just joking around and they were drunk um, and it changed yeah my values a little bit I, I started analyzing my values Do, are these the people I want to be hanging around is this the kind of place I, I'm not that kind of person it changed like everything in my mind and it's taken a good couple of weeks to sort of come back to all right move on you know and, and I, yeah i don't know if there as you say if there was something that like a bell someone could have chimed in that moment for me to to snap back and to take some of those new values that became sacred to me out and i think i think they've dropped out now yeah but now imagine if that guy you were walking with was a recruiter <laughs> who was trying to recruit you to be against your friends basically right i'd have done yeah, it he, you would have done it in that moment you might have, anything yeah he might have persuaded you anything yeah so that's what we call like a cognitive <laughs> opening. It's, it's a cognitive opening, essentially. It's like you have this moment and it can last for a short while or for a few weeks. <laughs> now, again, like, like, like we, we say that this, this feeling of social exclusion, you know, lasted for two minutes in the video game. Now, in real life, people who feel socially excluded are not experiencing it just for two minutes at a time. Every time they, they go online, they read the news, they watch TV, they step out of the house, they may be feeling it, or they may be hearing stories about their friends who are feeling it as well, based off of their tribal affiliation, their ethnicity, their religion, skin color, whatever. So it's much more consistent and ever-present part of people's lives. And so they may have, but yeah, it may become more acute at certain moments. Maybe they got dumped by their girlfriend on top of it, or they got fired on top of it. So that person might be, you know, in an acute stage of feeling a sense of social exclusion mm. in that particular moment. And, you know, if if one of their friends happens to be part of a group that sees itself as being in a battle, in, a, in, a, in an existential battle with the very group that just rejected you, and that is their whole ethos, is that they are the vanguard group that is combating that group that just rejected you you might be more open to joining them in that moment as i mean as we talk now news is is unfurling uh, of last night's um shoot school shooting in michigan um and i mean there was also there was something very recent in the uk there was a guy shooting uh was it plymouth or i don't know somewhere in the south coast wasn't it um who i imagine would have been going through those very things you're talking about probably yeah i mean we'll have to always wait i mean in specific cases i always like to wait and see uh, you know what more we learn about an individual uh, because at the individual profile level there's a lot of complexity but yes i mean i think probably um in most cases you'll be able to 
to see some element of this in a, in a person's story for joining these groups. Now, there are people who are coerced, and so therefore you could say they're not radicalized because someone literally put a gun to their family's head and said, you have to go, you know, carry out this act or, you know, smuggle these weapons for us. So coercion is a thing. Some people are born into an extremist uh, group. So they're just, their parents were part of the extremist group and that's the whole milieu they were raised in. So in that sense, they're not any different than any of us who have not particularly changed their political moral positions on issues too much in the course of their life. That's just mm-hmm. normal socialization. Do you find yourself sometimes going, come on, Nathis, I'm being I'm being tribal in the sense I'm 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 letting myself go along with something that isn't right. Do you have those urges as well? Sure, yeah. And so I, I mean, you you asked about Buddhism earlier. So I do meditate, I do engage in a lot of mindfulness meditation. And I don't think that Buddhism is necessarily trying to it's it's kind of it's, it's it's a difficult one. So it's trying to get you to lose your sense of self. However, there is a strong sense of community within within Buddhism. I mean, you generally are not it's a very western conceptualization of Buddhism where you just sit in your apartment and meditate for 10 minutes on your own. In actuality, Buddhists are part of what's called a sangha, which is a community of other meditators and you meet collectively and you meditate together and you console and help each other with a lot of issues so it's also very community based and that's where it's most effective um, in treatments for even things like helping people get off drug addiction for example is you want the group aspect of the meditation to be to be very much um, promoted but you know i do engage in meditation even on my own and it makes me very aware of the sort of signals within my body so oftentimes i can now I can really tell when I'm getting a little defensive. I can feel in my body when someone's saying something to me that I don't like, but I'm totally receptive to it and I'm open and I'm willing to hear. I can feel the relaxation in my body versus I can feel when the tension starts to come up. And it's and it's it's my body that sends me the signal to let me know what state I'm in. It's not like I my thought figures it out first, you know, like, oh, I'm getting defensive. Yeah. No, I'm I'm literally noticing the tension in my body. I'm noticing, you know, my heart rate increase. I'm noticing my vision narrow. I'm noticing all these physiological symptoms. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why, why this is this this is a parasympathetic response. This is a fight or flight response. This is I am perceiving threat in what the person is saying. I am responding to what this person is literally a belief that they have as though there's a saber toothed tiger, you know, <laughs> around the bend here. You know, like yeah. that's the way my body is responding to it. And so as soon as I feel that way, I'm like, well, okay, okay, take a breath, calm down, and then just listen. Just re- I mean, listening and really listening to someone and in a very empathetic way um, is kind of what gets me out of that. It's so frustrating because I you're trying to maybe win an argument, so you're trying to engage in something that is 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 very I guess the humans you think it's human and above the animal, you know. We're engaging in these intellectual thoughts, and then your body, time and time again, will let you down, and then will just go, "You nope, you're an animal. You're being an animal." And and I guess becoming aware of that happening, as you say, is the only way to uh, subdue it. And it's probably a more effective way to persuade a person anyways, right? Because if the other person is seeing that tension and that defensiveness in in you, they don't trust. They don't trust your arguments as much. They can see the tribalism. There's something enjoyable as well about getting someone to that state, isn't there? It's like, yeah, I'm going to poke the tiger. Especially if there's an audience too, right? Yeah. Because then it becomes a social (laughs) dominance game. Because it's people, yeah. and if you're two single oh, guys and there's some young, attractive women, there, then that's the worst possible situation, you know. Jordan Peterson loves uh, that. He he does that. He does that thing. Um, and I, I'm not for or against him. Before everyone writes in angrily on both sides of Jordan Peterson, because everyone's so angry about him. I have no, I don't care. But I do. He does this thing where people ask him a very long-winded question, and then he goes, "No," and everyone laughs, <laughs> and that's it. No, and they all laugh, and he wins. And I think like, oh, he, I bet he feels good in that moment. <laughs> probably probably yeah um but oh. yeah i mean I, I would say if you do want to persuade someone getting out of that stage will and kind of you know relaxing and listening to them and getting on the same wavelength as them is probably the level that is required to actually engage in belief change if you want if you want to have any impact i mean it's funny because i spend a lot of time talking to conspiracists and jihadists and white nationalists and i have to get into that headspace with them 
you know, I have to, I have to be very empathetic in order to get them to really start opening up and talking. And after we've been talking for an hour, hour and a half, whatever, I can see now their defenses are gone because they've been sitting in front of someone who has been sincerely listening to them in a way that sometimes even their own in-group members don't listen to them in that way. And I can see that if there was ever a time for me to try to change this person's mind, it would be right now because I just earned so much goodwill with them and have put them in, in a more vulnerable and less defensive state that I can begin to, to change their mind. I, as, it's not my job as a researcher to do that. So it's not, it's not what I'm trying to do in those situations. But sometimes I kind of inadvertently do it. I just start having a conversation with them and showing like my doubts about what they're saying. And then I can see that they're now, they're not trying to go through their Rolodex of counter arguments to somehow, you know, challenge what I just said, but now they're actually entertaining the doubt and it's become Trojan horsed in their head. And then maybe a week or two weeks later, they'll, they'll tell me, you know, I haven't been able to stop thinking about that. In a couple of cases, it has caused them to begin an unraveling process of some of their thinking. Now there was other things going on in the, in that person's life and, and, and their relationship with that group. So I don't want to take credit for, having pulled them out, but I think it, it played a small role in nudging them. It's quite, um, this nudging is, it's quite patronizing, isn't it? And I, I have to, I have to sort of catch myself doing it with my girlfriend and other people in my life sometimes when I do that sort of, because, because you said it's like they can see you're doing a sincere thing, but you have to act really well because secretly you're not actually being sincere, but you have to make them think you are. And then you almost convince yourself you are. It's like, no, no, but I do get what they're saying. And then really, but, but you, you did, this all this all ties in with what you've said in, in the video, I think, which was if to convince someone you what you want the voices from within that group. So for example, the people who maybe disavowed some of the stuff Trump might've said among Trumpists is one of the best ways to, to, to get some of the, the more extreme Trumpists away from those ideas. Yeah, so that was the second brain scan study that we did. That was with a far more radicalized group of people. Those were avowed supporters of Lashkari Taiba, which is a affiliate of Al Qaeda uh, based in Pakistan. We got about thirty of those guys into the brain scanner, and we looked at what was going on in their brain when they were judging their willingness to fight and die for their sacred values. And it was a different kind of pattern of neural activity. We saw that areas of the brain associated with self control which is also part of self-reflection and deliberation, those areas went offline when they were thinking about their sacred values and their willingness to fight and die. However, another part of the brain called the, uh, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with integration of emotions into decision-making, that part of the brain stayed online. Now, what was interesting is that um, as they, for their, when they had lower willingness to fight and die for their values, which were mostly non-sacred values, you saw these two areas of the brain active and you saw them kind of communicating with each other. And that's the normal way that the human brain works. So the example that I oftentimes give is, imagine you're out in, a, in, a, in an Italian restaurant and the waiter brings over a dessert menu and you see a nice tiramisu on there and you think, I want that tiramisu. But then you think, ah, you know, it's a lot of calories. I worked out today. I'm working out tomorrow. I'm trying to lose weight. I shouldn't do it. That is what you're having in that moment are those two parts of the brain activating the, 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 the emotional integration part of the brain. Ooh, I want that. I want, I want that tiramisu. And then the self-control uh, part of the brain activating saying, no, 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 come on now. And then they communicate and one wins out or the other, depending on whether you want it more, whether you have more self-control in that moment. So that's the normal way the human brain makes most decisions. These two parts of the brain kind of compete with each other and communicate. Like I said, when they had high willingness to fight and die, that one part of the brain related with self-control wasn't even online, let alone communicating. So in the second half of the experiment, what we did is that we showed the participants their willingness to fight and die again, that they rated uh, for each value. And they could click a button and they could see what their community's rating was for those values. So again, this is not other members or supporters of lashkar e taiba the terrorist group. This is the broader Pakistani community. And what we found was that when, when the community had lower willingness to fight and die than they had, um, that the, the, the parts of the brain that were previously offline, the part related to self-control, came back online. It was like a surprise to the person, right? The, the community doesn't agree with me. So all of a sudden, self-reflection starts to come back online. 
And they, when they got out of the scanner, they lowered their actual willingness to fight and die to conform to the community's mm-hmm. uh, norms on that uh, on that issue. And that that decrease in willingness to fight and die predicted the actual level of activation in the brain uh, in self-control regions. And we started seeing some communication happening again between these two regions of the brain. So essentially, we were able to get the person kind of more into a normal range of decision-making neurally and lower their actual willingness to fight and die just by, not by challenging their ideological system, not even by telling them that their community disagrees with their actual values, but just saying that the community disagrees with the willingness to fight and die for those values. So the, the commitment to violence. Because the community, if you tell them the community doesn't even agree with you on the values, then that means that they're not really your community because a lot of these, these communities oh, right, are yeah. defined by values. So they do have to feel like that this person agrees with me on the fundamental values, that they're a Trump supporter or whatever. Um, they challenge the, the the kinds of actions that I can take in defense of those values, whether I can do violence, whether I should peacefully protest, whether I should carry out a car bombing or whatever. So that kind of points to, you know, some of the, you know, when, you know, when I see like in the, in the New York Times video, uh, when I said, you know, when there's a white nationalist attack, you see all these left wing people like AOC or Reza Eslan saying things like, oh, you know, all of Trump's supporters are a bunch of white nationalists. They're all racist. They're all culpable for acts like this. To me, that sounds exactly like when conservatives, every time there's a jihadist terrorist attack, will say, oh, all Muslims are to blame or all conservative Muslims because they all basically, uh, you know, are, are, are enablers of this kind of extremism. What's funny is that intuitively they know not to say it when it's a jihadist attack. They know that that's stigmatizing. They know that you're only playing into the hands of the terrorists by doing that. You're othering and excluding the very group that you want to be including in your in your identity, um, which is what our first neuro uh, brain scan study showed, and then secondly, what you should be doing is amplifying the voices, conservative voices, even Salafi voices within Islam, or conservative voices, Trump supporters within a more far right wing movement in the United States, for example. Example, amplifying those voices that reject the violence that was carried out, because that will have far more impact on. On, on, on taking people off the edge of violence, whereas excluding them and talking down to them will only put more people onto that edge of violence. Yeah, but whether we're on the left or right, we're quite selfishly motivated, and <laughs> as I said, and um, and I guess emotional. I guess that's an example. Is it AOC? Are those the initials? Oops, I can't remember her, na- her name. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Yeah, I, I guess I guess that's that's an example of emotion overriding the what would be better for everybody. Well, no. So, so I think it's 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 better for the group. So, so if you want, so this is the, another big problem with humans is that what leads to social cohesion with a group is to convince them that there's another group out there that's their enemy. So, uh, yeah. so, so what, what AOC is doing in that situation, whether she's consciously doing it or not, is by making statements like that. She's galvanizing her own side. Now, it, it comes at the cost of polarization to society. So polarization is actually good for galvanization. So if you are a politician and you want to get elected and you want to create a a strong voter base, well, polarizing polarizing rhetoric is actually good for you. It'll help you get to where you want to get to. Thank you, man. That was so good. Yeah. That was really good. Cool. You know your stuff. Well, I really, I enjoyed that. It reminded me. I, I, there was, I, I could have spoken to you for another hour. I'd have brought up. I had more questions. Jesse Morton. I was going to talk about in prisons and all that, but it's just. Yeah. It's just the time, but it's a good reason to get you back in a year or something if you want. Did you enjoy that? Sounds good, man. Yeah, it was good. It was fun. Yeah, I was like, and I like podcasts the best out of all possible formats because you can just talk and have a normal conversation. And 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 there's something about the podcast format that allows you to, that you can increase your credibility by showing your own doubt, yeah. yes. which is as an expert in every other format you're actually disincentivized from you got to have your little one liners and you know your little you know um your 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 what do you call it um what's the expression the uh, sound bites yeah the oh, sound yeah. bites and everything like that so you have Long to form. come off as a yeah yeah so 
a credibility in those contexts is associated with actually with certainty. Whereas I think with podcasts and long form credibility is associated with uncertainty, which is I think what we need more of in the world is people embracing uncertainty, embracing doubt and yeah. acknowledging the gray areas and complexity. Yeah, we think that's what's good, but we don't know, do we? But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, and I thought exactly the same. That's when I started doing the podcast because I was making these documentaries, right? And obviously the documentary still feels like long form, but what's really happening is you're having lots of two-minute interviews with sound bites in them. And then I had to do a voiceover like, I, oh, I believe that what he was saying was this. And it's like, and I was always thinking like, but I don't know that. I, I, I need a longer thing to explain all of this. So I've really enjoyed doing this podcast because you can sort of go back and forward. And, and as you say, people appreciate that although as you also said they also like when it's like an alex jones figure who's just like well this is a thing that i think and it depends on what kind of listener i guess yeah exactly i mean obviously from the from the um content of the conversation we had i could make certain assumptions about who your listeners are and they probably Bloody great people <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh, right i'm gonna let's see uh, uh, what's uh, the listenership for this uh, uh twenty thousand weekly people oh, nice Right. Yeah, uh, it's grown. I mean, on YouTube, it's like each video gets like a hundred or so. You know, it's nothing. It, on the Patreon, which is when I do the bonus, it's like a couple hundred people who pay for the membership. It's almost okay. like it's like what is that one percent or something like? I don't even know. Maybe it's less. Um, but yeah, it's 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 built up. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Nafis Hamid. I've come away from that feeling 10 times smarter, although time will tell how much of that information on extremism and exclusion will stay in my head. Hopefully not too much so I can have someone like him back another time and feel like it's the first time I'm hearing it. Remember, there was no bonus this week. I'm sorry about that for those who've signed up, but Nafis had to go at that point, so we couldn't do that. But I did do a 30-minute live interview later that day with him on the Sean Atwood show. I was standing in for Sean uh, on his live three-hour Wednesday night show. Uh, 700 subscribers, pretty crazy. I was doing it alongside Dr. Shaham Das, the psychiatrist who's been on this podcast. And we also interviewed Stephen Knight, Eric Hunley, Charlie Robinson and Phil Chalmers who talks all about true crime and he was really really fascinating he's interviewed 500 murderers or something like that so go to Sean Atwood's channel for that on YouTube and since you're on YouTube subscribe to my channel if you don't usually watch the videos have a little look I've got the nice lights in the background I've made it look all pretty uh, on the edge with Andrew Gold on YouTube thanks to all the new Apple subscribers this week do keep signing up there and on Patreon you'll get bonus episodes and no more ads Although I know some of you quite like those ads. I got some good feedback on that one at the end last week uh, that I did with a couple of friends of mine when we were drinking the wine. Um, so do remember wine52.com slash Andrew, by the way, where you can get some free wine for Christmas. That'll be nice. Uh, those of you on Apple, I don't see your names, but just get stats or just get numbers. There are now almost 60 of you. Pretty extraordinary. Alongside 75 patrons and five YouTube members. So I can't thank you all enough for your support. Please keep signing up, everyone. It's a huge help. Helps to keep the podcast running. And do keep commenting on Apple and CastBox. I don't even know if it makes any difference, except to show people, because it's the only way they can see I probably have a big listenership if lots of people are reviewing, and then I can get the bigger guests on, so we all benefit. I've got to boost those review numbers. Thank you to Trisha in the UK for giving five stars and writing excellent. And thanks to Fizzy C, who gave five stars also in the UK, and wrote... Love this podcast. This has become my go-to podcast and I love it. Such interesting guests each week. I always feel I learn something from a different walk of life and I love how Andrew interacts with his guests in such a natural, chatty and relaxed way. Highly recommended you scroll back to the beginning and catch up and let you listen to the bonus episodes if you can. Thank you so much, Fizzy C. That was a beautiful review. I loved reading it. And that's all for now. There'll be William Costello next week, or Ney Pagan, who's talking about drunk animals. I'm reading his book about it. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, David Robson and his new book, The Expectation Effect. Jordan Harbinger, one of the world's biggest podcasters who was kidnapped. Uh, David Badil, the comedian. John Ronson, the writer of The Psychopath Test and So You've Been Publicly Shamed. Amanda Knox uh, from The Trial. You know, she was arrested apparently falsely. Well, falsely, we can say falsely, I think so, um, for, the, for the murder of her student flatmate in Italy uh, I've said David Robson haven't I let's say David Robson again he's coming it's the second time he's coming on and I'm a big fan of his he did the intelligence trap and now it's the expectation effect about 
or was it about? Oh, I've I've read half of it so far. I'm loving that book. Um, about how the thing, the way we expect things to happen, can change the results. Of course, but for example, some of the examples are crazy. And there was this one uh, group of people who had this tradition where they believed in uh, some sort of ghost that kills them in their sleep, and loads of them were dying in their sleep. Um, and because of the expectation, they were having heart attacks from fear in their sleep, which is extraordinary. It just shows how powerful the brain is. Uh, Carl Zimmer is another who's coming on soon, scientist who talks about what life is. What's Is a brain alive? Is a person alive? Well, a person is. Uh, but where do we draw the line between what is alive and what isn't? So those are who's coming on. Many, many more. Uh, do follow Nafis Hamid, by the way. You've got all the links in the in the show notes. He was fantastic. And I'll see you next week.